When it comes to data logging, we have to abide by our ethics um, office uh, rules here. And all your requests for knowing where the people are, that's a problem. <laughs> because the first thing you gotta do is say right up front, we are gonna be able to determine where you live, work, shop, go, etc. if you use GPS for the purposes. Right? So then you gotta decide what sort of data are you actually going to acquire. Because it's probably you don't wanna know just where they live, you wanna know how and when they're using it, which means you need more temporal data. So there are some complexities uh, related to getting some of that data. Again, I didn't incorporate that, but uh, something we can certainly talk about. What I did do is sort of um, try to summarize the research that I'm involved in, a lot of it with other colleagues at the university here, and if I know they're presenting today, I'm gonna to let them expand on their side of things. Um, so let's just proceed. So electrified vehicle research, uh, this, this slides will be made available to anyone because there's an awful lot of detail here. Um, my, certainly my major area of research is in the design of powertrains. I'm the um, co, um, faculty advisor for the alternative fuels team. I've been advising that team since 1996. And we design vehicles from the ground up. Um, and also, and one of the things about our most recent vehicle that we've designed in Malibu is we use an extensive amount of drive cycle data. So the drive for data program um, would have been invaluable to us, but we didn't have that data at the time. So I have to thank uh, Cross Chasm for helping the team out uh, with that data. But it was invaluable and uh, um, it was recognized through awards, uh, through the competition. People recognized just how important it was. I won't go into details why it's important. It's just critical, and you can come up. Um, alternative fuels, I've worked with alternative fuels, hydrogen, ethanol now, hydrogen most recently before that, propane, reformulated gasoline, and the like. Controls, uh, drive cycles, again, and the vehicle um, design. You're interested in efficiency, intelligent vehicle, intelligent transportation vehicles. That relates a lot to what Amir, um, does. We do a little bit of on the alternative fuel, sort of dabble in it, but if you want the real hard research, you go to um, Amir and his group on that. But this is where you start talking about what I'm gonna say, consumers' acceptability, consumers, what they want in a vehicle. And to what we're discovering um, in our competitions, because we're judged not just by the engineers, but we're also judged by consumers. Consumer Report actually comes out and will judge our vehicles and then give us feedback. Um, what we're finding is that you actually have to understand the customer and how they're gonna behave, and drive cycles is just part of that. There are other aspects to it um, that you need to know, um, and you're finding that out by having your employees drive your vehicles and then asking them questions. That's part of it, and something I don't think Tracy emphasized in her discussion is that drive for that is not just about drive cycles. It's also about accessing the customers through surveys that would be done through research by researchers on campus. So surveys can be done to get that more consumer-based uh, information. Um, then we have the performance, traction control, consumer acceptability, sorry, I was just saying that we sort of led into that. And then consumer acceptability has a lot to do with driver um, influence and behavior. And that's where I'm going to sort of, just sort of focus today, when, when I put this presentation together, because we were talking about the drive for data and that connection, and we know that it starts with the data, then you do the analysis. Um, the comment I'll make about drive cycles is it's fundamental to everything I've listed here. If you're gonna design drivetrains, it's fundamental. If you're gonna understand the emissions from vehicles, it's fundamental. If you're gonna understand consumer acceptability of the things you're offering them, the drive cycles are always gonna be there. It's buried behind everything. That's why the drive for data is so good. Um, I'm involved with a project with Grand River Car Share, uh, Burlington Hydro, and of course our vehicle, the um, alternative fuels vehicle, and it's a plug-in hybrid electric vehicle. Now, what I found interesting about the discussion this morning, and all the discussions I've been to when you get electric utilities in the room, uh, the Grid Smart City being the last one I was at in the, sort of the big way um, up there in Waterloo, is that EVs, your definition of EVs is different than my definition of EVs. My definition of an EV is pure electric. If you're gonna say electric vehicle, it's pure electric. There is no extended range on it. But the Volt is sold as an EV and then they tag on extended range. It's really a plug-in hybrid electric vehicle. And it, my personal opinion is your first vehicle for the next while, if you are gonna buy the EV in the broad sense, 
it's going to be an extended range electric vehicle for your first vehicle. It's only if you have a second vehicle that you'll probably go with the pure EV, most people. But, all right. Um, so I'm going to talk about plug-in electric vehicles. Berlin Hydro, though, is a pure EV, and there's some very interesting things you've observed there. I'll then lead in from the drive cycles into grid smart city apps, um, life cycle, sort of those secondary business side of things that you were mentioning. So this is the vehicle that we've um, outfitted with a data logger with the help of Cross Chasm uh, down there at Burlington Hydro. Uh, it's the, the key thing about this is where it's not the vehicle that the executive drives, it's the vehicle that the engineers and the technologists drive. That was sort of a key feature of this particular drive cycles we were looking at. So this was more oriented towards their fleet um, at the time. And in terms of the motivation for this, there's sort of multiple aspects to the motivation. Uh, in terms of the electric vehicle, Brilliant Hydro was interested in the charging profile. The driving profile has mutual interests, time of day for the utilities, for us, how do we design our vehicles. And ambient temperature, I guess I do have a little bit of weather in here. Uh, we're looking at temperature, temperature being critical for performance of the batteries. Um, whether you have to do some secondary um, power to heat them up or whether you can just run them the way they are. So it's not just drawing them below 20% charge, it's also what temperature they're running at. And if they actually get too hot, um, then you start having fires. And I think we've heard about fires recently with batteries. So um, down here, evaluating performance and life, again, here's the con consumer concerns, cost range, uh, two things that have been mentioned extensively this morning. And we're also interested in that second use side of things. So this is sort of the framework of the project we're doing with uh, Burlington Hydro. Just a sample of types of data you would collect. Here's a, a drive cycle that was obtained from their vehicle, and we've been monitoring the state of charge of that. So some technical, buried technical information on that battery. The state of charge, you will notice, dropped below the 20%. <laughs> It was draw, driven further than you would actually want it to be driven, probably to extend the life of this battery. That's a piece of behavior that we observed um, in the vehicle. Um, other things we, just in technical data, so just a little deeper into the vehicle, this happens to be battery resistance. Battery resistance changes on the temperature of the, uh, the battery, on the age of the battery. This is primarily um, a temperature and current draw related resistance um, profile but useful for knowing what your losses are, what your potential efficiencies are, and maybe what the end of life uh, uses of that battery are. And then, oh, I should answer, just, I, I referred to uh, Professor Kajapur for some of the intelligence systems. Professor Fowler is doing the basic uh, battery work. My involvement is at the vehicle level and up uh, with, that, uh, with the batteries. Uh, this is some sort of cross fundamental work thermal, so it's in the mechanical engineering area. And this is just a thermal profile of a battery uh, being discharged and the hot profile being near the, the negative electrode and then the change in temperature and then at the end of a discharge. Now the temperature is relevant from a design of a vehicle, we've got to make sure we cool them or keep them in a proper temperature range. It's also relevant from a degradation viewpoint, how uniform it is, where the charge is being pulled from, so that's ongoing research here. And we are fitting a few vehicles to measure the temperature of the battery on specific uh, cells and the like. Okay? Um, and then this is just to emphasize that more, it's not just temperature, it's really the heat that you also produce and what you have to design towards. So, <clears throat> The second uh, life side of things that we do some work on, we have um, Professor Fowler, Professor Young over in Environmental Studies, myself doing some life cycle on uh, the second use of uh, the lithium ion side of things, but also looking at other aspects um, and interest in other aspects. So the second use of it, you know, you start with the manufacturing, you go down here, uh, you have to refurbish. So here's your automobile, you have to refurbish. So there's a whole industry side to refurbishing that's probably not a utility of interest. Utility interest probably comes in here when you employ the battery in the second use, right? And this is just, uh, I had a student uh, prepare um, 
part of a Transport Canada report, we were looking at second use and sort of the cost payback. And what you have here is sort of a revenue, sort of it was looking at revenue uh, and estimating what your maximum revenue would be and a minimum revenue for different activities. Uh, and here's regulation of the electricity in an area, for example. I, I, I'm not saying this was perfect. This was what you would call a first cut at trying to estimate numbers. It would definitely need more grid information to get um, uh, higher levels of certainty on some of these numbers. But we were just taking a look at a large uh, number of different things here, transmission support, service reliability, um, wind generation. So you can also envision not just from a utility perspective controlling the, um, uh, the quality of electricity or dealing with uh, your subgrids and capacity loads. You can also, um, on a larger scale, if you do have wind energy involved, um, batteries do come into play. One thing I will mention about wind energy or renewable energies that often gets missed, um, and maybe because I'm a mechanical engineer in the thermal area, I like to mention it. Batteries are not the only way to store energy from renewables or off-peak. So if you are looking at load leveling, it's not the only way. Professor uh, Fowler uh, works on um, hydrogen as an off-grid method. Um, I've um, been involved um, very minorly, but I've been involved in thermal storages where you integrate with actually houses in the area to, to do their air conditioning loads. And ice is actually a great thermal load leveler, or a great load leveler um, method. Austin, Texas has a fantastic uh, um, example of that with their wind energy. That, this, so that's sort of the Berlin Hydro project in an extreme summary. Uh, another project is the alternative fuel vehicle where we actually learn about the vehicles. Now what's really important about learning about the vehicles, the first thing we learned um, a long time ago, and Matt was actually the one when he was the uh, team lead of this that brought this idea out, the classic way of designing a vehicle is you give the specifications, you go through, the, pick the parts, put your car together, control it, put it on the road. But that's not how it needs, should be working, and that's not the best way. What you find is when you get to the controls, and that was our control lead at the time, is that you actually get feedback in how you design the vehicle. You should redesign the vehicle for the controls. And you don't learn how to redesign the vehicle until you've done the controls, and it's a cyclic design loop. And that makes sense from an engineering design perspective. I expect, have not been involved in it, that if we go that one next step forward, the car integrating with the utility, there's gonna be a feedback design loop into the manufacture of the vehicles from the utilities. Um, and this sort of project certainly allows us to understand how the, industry, the automotive industry can integrate things into vehicles. All right, so if you have ideas at the utility level, can you really integrate them at the vehicle level? And we have an understanding of that through this type of uh, research. Um, another thing I'll just say in terms of what we do here at Waterloo, and multiple researchers do this, model-based design. So even if you're just thinking about it, we can go to the models and do some very detailed modeling to get information. Um, and this might seem like an, an outside part, but another thing that I spend a lot of time on, I have two MBA students right now from Wilfrid Laurier helping with this, Eric helped with this in the past, but as part of the Alternative Fuels team, we work on outreach, we work on educating the public, we work on actually trying to find out what their perceptions are about electric vehicles, down at the grade six, seven, and eight level, as well as upwards. And we get a lot of students that get interested in this aspect of how do you understand these technologies when they get out there. So I just want to point that we also have this interest of this education side, at least on the alternative fields. It's not research, but we do link with the MBA students at Wilfrid Laurier, and it does work into their program. Um, that was an extremely short summary of a couple of things that I thought may be of interest. Um, it's the end of the presentation. This is a picture of the Challenge X vehicle. Uh, nice picture. Um, and if you have any questions, I'd be glad to, to answer them. Um, you know, I think for me it's really to find out what are the opportunities for uh, integrating our needs with other research that's going on. Uh, we're all part of the Grid Smart City group as well. And through some discussions, found out backwards way uh, what Burlington was up to, and they're finding out what we're up to. And so yeah. So it's really sharing of some of that, making sure that some of those opportunities are there. I'd be interested in, in uh, certainly some of the data logging on uh, our bucket trucks to see what kind of things they're doing. So 
that may be something that we want to pursue further and uh, get some ideas on that. Yeah, I'd love to dialogue your bucket trucks um, in addition to beyond what you know, your consumer vehicles. One thing I didn't mention about that we've learned from the Burlington um, Hydro uh, exercise is that the technicians and engineers really don't like driving the electric vehicle. And if you look at their drive cycles, it's not a range problem. And it's not a performance problem. It's completely a perception that maybe it'll be a range problem. But if you look at the range that they go over, it's all within the range of the vehicle, not even getting close to the end. When that one drive cycle I showed you where I got close to the end, they're actually pushing it. They actually intentionally said, I'm going to push it today. Right? But so. they being selected what, uh, what field jobs they're using it for? No, it's, it's, it's outfitted the same as the other two vehicles. There's, there's three vehicles that are basically outfitted the same way. So they just choose to use the uh, other vehicles first. The gas-powered vehicles. Gas -powered vehicles and the hybrid electric vehicle over the electric I'm vehicle. I'm saying that they've got a choice if there's a fleet of vehicles that can choose these four. Yeah. But they choose them the gas-powered vehicle, and that's why the range for the electric vehicles is shorter. Yes. They, they, they choose them, and, but it goes back a little bit to sort of what Matt was saying, that if you're going to have an electric vehicle, and I also said your second car would be an electric vehicle, but to get the cost effectiveness, you actually have to get people wanting to drive the electric vehicle, right? So there's, 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 uh, there's right now there's a disconnect between just even that desire to drive the electric vehicle when there's no performance, no operational, no range anxiety issues at hand. So the, the two things that uh, certainly tied our folks, the couple of things that they're concerned about is Usability. So, is the vehicle the same in terms of uh, storage of things and uh, the ability to throw tools and equipment in exact same. compared to one that is not? And, and you know, we've certainly looked at saying, okay, we're going to get a style of vehicle, it's got to be one that affords them the ability to work in the same kind of uh, atmosphere of the vehicles that they have because of the tools and equipment. And then the other issue that comes along for some of our folks is. Uh, when they set up the amount of lights and stuff that they have to have running. This is what took us a while to find the right device for the uh, bucket truck. Mm. Because when they set up, the amount of lights that they have uh, drains batteries very, very quickly. They gotta have lights running, they gotta have uh, radios running, and so that becomes the issue for them as well. So those are some of the things and, and what we're looking at is saying, okay, what kind of vehicle, uh, not only for the issues of range anxiety, but the issues of Workability, carrying the tools, and then set up on site. Can I still run my two-way radios, my laptop, and, and my uh, safety lights, the same as I do today? Yeah, certainly a vehicle that's not just the driving there and pulling stuff out where you're using it. But that's not this vehicle. No, no, no. But that's not yeah, those but but I think there are. So every every vehicle is going to have its own sort of set of things that make it desirable and undesirable. But it's just surprising with this particular vehicle. It's so undesirable. It's just, it's, it's in its perception. Um, even when they're encouraged, it's, yeah. Oh, I'm, I'm done. <laughs> <laughs>